This podcast contains discussions of child abuse, sexual repression and sexual abuse, suicide, racism, misogyny, PTSD and PTSD symptoms, and spiritual oppression and abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we will be mentioning some of these concepts in a general way without any graphic detail. If any of these topics or other triggering topics will be mentioned in great detail, we will let you know at the beginning of each individual episode, as well as in the show notes for that episode. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Leaving Eden podcast. My name is Gavriel Hakoen, and you're probably here because you want to hear the story of my best friend, Sadie Carpenter. I met Sadie as a coworker working in the office of a car dealership. We quickly bonded over our love of music and over our interest in religion. At this time, I had no idea that Sadie was raised in a cult. I found her to be a fantastic and engaging person and an extremely analytical thinker, but I had no idea just how much of her identity she had to build up brick by brick after leaving the cult. In March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic saw us both laid off and quarantined in our respective homes, and we decided to take the opportunity to tell her story in podcast form. I had a fairly secular Jewish upbringing, and at the point you're hearing this, I have no knowledge of Christian fundamentalism. I barely even know anything about Christianity outside of the very basics. I am so excited to have my misconceptions challenged. I'm excited to ask the stupid questions, and I'm so excited that you are going to join us on this journey. And now, for the first time on the Leaving Eden podcast, I am delighted to introduce my BFF and co-host, Sadie Carpenter. So I'm not sure which story of mine caught your attention the most. I know I definitely made you laugh when I told you about the first movie that I ever went to see. And I know the story about how I almost got expelled from Colt College is pretty good, too. But whichever it was, I'm glad you finally talked me into sharing my craziest stories with the world. Well, I'm yeah, glad I'm, you're here. I'm glad I'm here, too. I'm excited to, to start getting some of these tall Give tales it. out there. <laughs> So I was born into an independent, fundamental Baptist church that also happened to be part of a cult. I was raised in that group from birth. It was all I had ever known. I did have my doubts about the group, and I was really curious about outside life in the outside world. But my access to the world outside the movement was very limited. So when I was 18... I was offered the opportunity to go to several different colleges, but ultimately I decided to go to Hiles Anderson College, which is an unaccredited Bible college in the Chicago area. Uh, I wanted to give you a concept of what Bible college is like. So there are only a few degree programs available. At the time I went, men could go to college to be a pastor, an assistant pastor, a Christian school teacher, or a missionary or they could study for a general Bible knowledge degree. Women could go to college to be a Christian school teacher, a wife and mother. Yes, there's a unaccredited college degree. It's literally called marriage and motherhood. Or they could earn a general Bible degree. So my sophomore year, they loosened up a little bit and finally allowed women to enroll in the missions degree as well. So when I attended uh, Hiles Anderson College, Jack Scopp was the pastor of First Baptist Church of Hammond, which is the church that is affiliated with the college and a mega church that will feature really heavily in my personal story. Between my freshman and my sophomore year at Hiles Anderson, Jack Scopp was caught committing statutory rape and he ultimately went to prison. That event really solidified the doubts that I was having and I started the process of leaving the Independent Baptist Church as well as the evangelical movement as a whole. Leaving for me wasn't a precise moment in time. It was more of a process that took several years. But as time passed and as I've worked on healing, I've come to really enjoy telling my story. 
I know that I, I could hide it and try to just fit in with everyone else. A lot of people who do have PTSD or past traumatic experiences don't like to talk about them. And that's, that's totally okay. But for me, it feels a lot more honest to talk about where I've been. I've had some very funny things happen to me in my life, and I've been through some truly insane things. <laughs> I really like to laugh with people about my old misconceptions. I really like to share the crazy stories, like the time I army crawled through a very dusty crawl space under an old building in a denim skirt armed only with a flashlight and a pretty large knife in my belt. But I, <laughs> it's, oh, it's a great story. Oh, I'm anxious to hear that one. Oh, you will. But I also like to share on a more serious note what I've learned about healing from spiritual abuse and healing from toxic positivity. And I like to encourage other people to take their lives into their own hands like I did. Most of these stories are stories that I have yet to hear. So I'm just excited as everyone who is listening. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's just get a few things out of the way. Um, so you described your cult as Baptist. What is Baptist and are the independent fundamental Baptists that you described representative of Baptist or Christianity as a whole? So Baptist in particular are Christians who are primarily distinguished by the importance that they place on baptism by immersion. So being completely submerged in water as opposed to being sprinkled or having water poured on you the way that Catholics and other denominations do. Yeah, I'm sure we've, I mean, we've seen it in movies like many mm -hmm. times and they'll like take somebody to a river or something. Yes. And there's, and there's lots of, of old songs about it that you can hear. It all harkens back to John the Baptist, who was a prophetic figure, the cousin of Jesus. They were contemporaries. And John the Baptist was a prophet who spoke about Jesus and baptized people in the River Jordan. So Baptists believe that baptism, while it's not completely essential to go to heaven, it is highly significant. And it must be done after the person is at an age to consent, and they must be fully submerged in water. So they have to decide, uh, yes, I want this for my life. Right. Now, that age of consent, or it's often called the age of accountability, the exact age of a person that that is is really debated among Baptists. Uh, independent fundamental Baptists will baptize children as young as three or four. Uh, wow. Some, yeah, more mainstream Baptist denominations, a more common age that you would hear is eight, nine, or ten. So yeah. most people would say that Baptists are a sect of Protestantism, but many Baptists would disagree. They would claim that their faith is directly descended from John the Baptist and the Apostles, and that they are not and have never been Protestants because they never exited from the Catholic Church. Right. Catholicism was never part of their doctrine to begin with. They couldn't exit from something they weren't a part of. Right. You can't protest or leave something that you were never part of to begin with. And then there are denominations within the broad category of Baptist. Uh, one of the biggest ones is the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, a lot, and it's, and it's not just in the American South, quite a few ba of the Baptist churches in the United States are part of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's a very common denomination. Yes, it is a very, a very common Baptist denomination. You also have the Northern Baptists, the American Baptists, and each of those denominations would have a constitution that applies to all the churches in that denomination. They have a board of directors that help decide things like what Bible translation they're going to use or whether their ministers are going to be allowed to marry gay couples. Things like that would be decided by the board of directors and then passed down to all the churches in that denomination who are expected to then fall in line or leave so, the denomination. So there's a lot of different kinds of Baptists because, yeah, <laughs> you know, one of the things that I was thinking about is that when some people hear Baptist, they think Jerry Falwell. And then when other hear, people hear Baptist, they think of uh, the Reverend Dr. King, both of whom were Baptist reverends whose missions could not be any more different. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, within the broad umbrella category of Baptists, there are many different denominations, 
And then you have the Independent Baptist. Independent Baptist movement is a national movement, and it is a, a loosely related group of churches, but they're not a denomination. They don't have that corporate structure of a board of directors that then tells bishops what to do, that then tell uh, pastors what to do. Each independent Baptist church is independent within itself. The pastor is the highest authority, and that's it. There's no one telling the pastor what to do or telling that church how to run their finances or what Bible translation to use or who they can and can't marry. It is all, all of that power is localized within each individual local church. So we talked about what Baptist means and what independent means. I wanted to define fundamental for you real quickly. Right, because it is independent fundamental Baptist. So that's the... Right. So Christian fundamentalists are essentially Christians who adhere to the fundamentals of the Christian faith. There was a series of doctrinal essays called The Fundamentals that was published after World War I, and it defined the Christian fundamentalist position on quite a few doctrinal topics, things like uh, whether Jesus Christ was the Son of God, whether the Bible is without error, or whether the Bible can have mistakes in it. The fundamentals also uh, argued against higher criticism and liberalism. But as time went on, churches that espoused this book, The Fundamentals, became more and more strict in their rules, not just their theology, because they wanted to be as separate from the world as possible. In the viewpoint of people who are Christian fundamentalists, the world is becoming more and more wicked and sinful. And the evidences that they see for that are the gay rights movement, women's liberation and feminism. They see these changes that a lot of people see as, as progress. They see those changes as threats. They believe that the world is becoming more and more wicked and sinful, and that as the world becomes worse and worse, they need to separate themselves further and further from the world. So the word separation is something that you would hear a lot if you listen to independent Baptist preachers' sermons. Separation became like a rallying cry along with the word fundamentalist, and it became a point of pride to be as separate from the world as possible. So in the 1920s, a preacher might have said, no true Christian believes that the Bible can be criticized or be wrong in any way. In the 1960s, it became, no true Christian would ever drink alcohol. And by the 1980s or the 1990s, when I was born into the movement, it became, no true Christian would ever go to a movie or let his wife wear pants. So these standards got stricter and stricter over it's just time. more repressive. More yeah. More repressive. And those rules... Time. Yeah, and those rules and regulations for living a righteous life became inseparably woven in with the doctrinal points that define a Christian fundamentalist. So as the rules got stricter and stricter, the fundamentalist movement distanced themselves not just from the world, but from other Christian groups. And they became more and more insular until we ended up with the independent fundamental Baptist movement that we have now. So when we talk about independent fundamental Baptists, we're talking about a subset of a subset of a subset of Christianity. And I did want to note that even among that small group of Baptists who are fundamentalists, who are also independent, not every church should be considered part of a cult. Many IFB churches do fit the definition of a cult, but there are some that don't. So we don't want to generalize everybody into that's that right. definition of cult. That's right. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's great that we're doing this podcast is because both of us are still religious people and it would be disingenuous of us to have two atheists who are basically saying, look at this crazy repressive cult over here. This is representative of what Christianity is and it's representative of what all religion is is in general. That's not what we're going to do. The point of our of us doing this podcast is that we want to say that every person has the right to decide what their own personal relationship is with God and religion. Right. And we're also not here to attack 
individual people who believe in the fundamentals of the Christian faith. We're right. not here to in- attack individual people who are happy to read the King James Bible and don't believe that other Bibles are the Word of God, other translations. Uh, I'm I'm not here to attack anybody like that. I'm here we might to... make fun of people. We might make fun of people a little bit. But <laughs> we it's... might poke fun, but I'm not here to to attack anybody in those shoes. I'm here to attack toxic and manipulative and controlling cult like behavior. On that note, I think that we should move on to talk about specifically what defines a cult. Because I've heard many people say, in sort of an offhanded manner, "Oh, all religions are really cults," or "All religions start as cults." But there's not really truth to that because we have a very specific model. Like you can have a religion that only has 100 or 50 or 20 or two people, but that doesn't necessarily make it into a cult. And you can have a cult that has millions of people. But what we've got here is a specific set of attributes that define something as a cult rather than just being a regular religion. Right. Uh, It's always really funny, the questions I get, by the way, when I first say something about, oh, by the way, I was raised in a cult. Uh, The most common question I get is, were you raised on a compound? Which is... (laughs) Because everyone saw Waco. Because, yeah, everyone saw Waco and everybody knows about Jonestown. And those seem to be the two that really are are the most in people's minds. So people want to know if I was raised on a compound and people want to know how I escaped drinking the literal poison (laughs) Kool-Aid. So there's always a little explaining to do. Because that's what we hear about. But the cult that you were raised in specifically, it has people everywhere. Yeah. All over um, the country. I, I won't give specifics, but there is a rather large group of people who are part of that group uh, within 50 miles of where we're recording this podcast. Wow. Okay. I did yeah, not know in that. in liberal blue state Oregon. So there are fortunately exact ways to define what is and isn't a cult. And the best way to do that is Stephen Hassan's BITE model. So that's B-I-T-E. And I think it, it is just the absolute best research in the easiest format. Yeah, uh, so BITE is an acronym. Yeah, it's an acronym for behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. Yeah, so I think the easiest one for people to get their heads around is going to be behavior control because that's the one that's not only common of cults, but it's also, you know, just common of cultures or religions in general. So it could be something like saying, you eat this food and you don't eat this food, or you dress this way and you don't dress this way. Right. You wear this particular religious garment all the time. Yeah. Or you know, people who are of this religion fast during these certain days. Right. That itself is not necessarily bad. If you look at the examples, some of them are totally fine and totally normal, but some of them are much more insidious. So for instance, things like preventing you from sleeping or separating you from your family or right. or depriving you from time by yourself. That's that's correct. So just because a religion or any group like the military or a job has some of these aspects of a cult does not necessarily make it truly a cult. It's when you start getting a long list of these things that all add up. When somebody has their behavior controlled, their emotion controlled, their thought controlled, and their emotions controlled, eventually they become easy to manipulate. So a cult isn't really defined by how many of these things it does to you or makes you do. It's more defined by does it do enough of these things that it makes you easy to manipulate and that it's able to control all the parts of who you are as a person. Right. Okay. Well, so now we've got that one out of the way. Let's move on to information control. Can you give us an example of like from the IFB cult that you were raised in? What is what is a good example of information control that you experienced? So a really good example of information control uh, would be forbidding you from speaking with former members, people who have left, or critics. Uh, Also dividing information into insider versus outsider doctrine. So you hear that if you're listening to this and you're currently IFB, Sadie is a former member, so you're not allowed to listen to this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when you divide into insider versus outsider... What I was always told growing up is that people who are not 
and and they don't use words like people who are not IFB. Instead, they'll say it a different way. They'll say people who are not right with God or people who are not spirit-led Christians. So it's all these little euphemisms, but you know what they mean. What was the word that you said uh, they would use to describe outsiders? Was it worldly? Worldly, yes. Worldly. So somebody who's worldly is somebody who is focused on the things of the modern world, which are exactly what we are supposed to be distancing ourselves further and further from. So you're separating yourself from the world, and these are people that you're supposed to be separating yourself from. Right. Well, I think those two things, though, go really hand in hand, because when you when all of your information is either in the category of this information is coming from someone who is right with God or somebody who is a separated soul-winning fundamentalist or whatever euphemism they use instead of the word insider, or this information is by somebody who's worldly, this information is by an unsaved person, you are taught to only trust that insider information. Only and it's trust. information. it's information that has to be pre-approved. So it's not like Correct. a... You can look at all the information. This is what we say you don't look at. It's don't look at any information unless we say that you can look at it beforehand. Right. So uh, growing up, for example, uh, I wanted to learn about evolution because I was interested in debates uh, and I was interested in maybe representing creationism in a debate against somebody who believed in evolution. But I wanted to learn about the principles of evolution so that I could accurately debate my viewpoint of creationism. But I couldn't get any good information about evolution because the page for E in our dictionary had been cut out because the word evolution was on it. And the page, yeah, the page in my school encyclopedia, quite a few pages were missing from my school encyclopedia. But one of those things was anything regarding evolution would be cut out. And my school books didn't teach. My school books didn't teach about evolution. They just taught reasons not to believe evolution. See, that's the thing that I don't understand is how they can expect you to argue against something if you don't even know what it is. Blind faith is how they expect you to do that. Blind faith wrote memorization of their side of things. So when information was divided like that into people who believe creationism and people who believe evolution. And I only have access to information by people who believe in creation. I have no way, you know, as a young teenager of learning about evolution, I can't even get to the point of considering, do I believe in creation or do I believe in evolution? I can't even come to that decision point of let me research both sides and decide what I believe because I'm prevented from even even beginning the process of gathering information wow. because I only have access to inside information. So before we get on to anything else, I want to say that this information about the Byte model is available online on freedomofmind.com, and I will put the link to that in the show notes. But the last piece of information control that I wanted to talk about was this one I see here that says that they would encourage you to spy and report on others' misconduct. Is that something that you experienced? Yeah, absolutely. Um, In fact, that's how I almost got expelled from cult college. Uh, Someone saw me doing a terrible, terrible thing. (laughs) What was it? Oh, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you another time. (laughs) Oh, okay. Okay. We'll have a special episode just about that one. (laughs) Oh, it's a great, it's a great story. (laughs) But someone saw me uh, doing something that I was not supposed to do. And they informed on me to the college authorities that were in charge. A dirty snitch. Yeah, and, yeah, and it was not somebody I expected to snitch on me either. Snitch. I was really hurt. Like Sweet. I thought that dude was cool. Yeah, and like I totally thought that dude was cool too. Well, you got to make sure that upset. your soul is right with God. Like if you saw somebody doing bad, you know, what are you gonna do? Just like not snitch on them? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so you would definitely be encouraged. In some of the more strict independent Baptist churches, if you saw a church member smoking a cigarette or going into a liquor store or whatever else they weren't supposed to be doing, you would be encouraged to tell your pastor so that your pastor could um, basically subtweet them from the pulpit the next Sunday. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> so or in the you. really strict churches, straight up call them out. <laughs> I don't know. They they see you at, at like the strip club or something, and they're just like, <laughs> there are people within this congregation that patronize the bordello. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually kind of accurate. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So and they just be like, and, and, the, and, and you just be in the pews like it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Like, but everyone knows. Yes. So but everyone you, knows because because the rumor because everyone around. gossips. Yeah. yeah. But they they you, spill the tea. They spill all the tea. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, if you really wanted to use the IFB accurate words, you would say uh, houses of ill repute and women of the night. Houses of ill repute? Yes. Houses wow. of ill repute. That's what you call a, a strip club or any place sex work goes down. I mean, I feel like my house is probably just like a house of ill repute just because I live <laughs> there. But moving on, thought control is the next one that we go to from information control. So thought control is, I guess, the next logical step. Yes. And I think thought control, if I can be honest, uh, I think thought control is maybe the one that I still struggle with the most. The the one piece of this that still affects me on a daily basis. So well, that makes sense. It's hard to get that out of your head. You know, using thought control, it makes you doubt your own mind. Right. It's a it's a gaslighting type behavior, and it programs you to have specific thought responses to specific things. A good example of this might be uh, the first time I ever kissed a girl. I Ooh. well, yeah, I was pretty I was pretty excited about that. <laughs> I have waited quite a while to get to that point finally. And I woke up the morning after said girl had been kissed. And the first thought that popped into my head when I saw the sunlight and opened my eyes the next morning was, I'm a bad person. God doesn't love me anymore. I'm going to hell. Wow. And this was, I was out of the cult by then. Clearly. Clearly. (laughs) This was quite a while after I had left the cult. I had not been to an IFB church in at least two years at that point maybe a little longer than that. And still, and I was, you know, I was well on my way to becoming who I am today. I did not think that kissing a girl would be a sin. I did not logically believe any of that anymore. It says nothing about lesbian relationships in the Bible. Just want to put that out there. uh, IFB preachers have plenty to say about them. (laughs) Mm, Well, But no, I woke up, and that should have been like a really joyful moment in my life. You know, I finally got a, a really good experience. You experienced something new for the first time and it was and exciting. something that I really wanted to experience. And it was a very lovely, you know, consensual encounter that I had. And I still woke up the next morning, the birds were chirping, the sun was shining. It was a beautiful morning the next day. And I woke up and the first thing that popped into my head was, oh my God, what have I done? God does not love me. I have sinned. God will never love me again. I'm going to hell. So another thing that I heard you speak about earlier was toxic positivity. Mm -hmm. And it says here, one of the aspects of thought control is only allowing positive thoughts. Yes. So that's something that is taught much more heavily to women within the IFB movement. Um, Women are very much put on a pedestal and expected to behave and think in a very particular way. There is so much to get into there, but one of the main things that women are always taught is to be positive. No matter what has happened, no matter what kind of terrible situation you're in, you are expected to never speak negatively to or about your husband, never speak negatively to or about your pastor, never speak negatively about any man in leadership, never speak negatively about a woman who's in leadership over you. And generally, to say as few negative statements and have as few negative feelings as possible. So it's it's full Stepford wife. Absolutely. Um, I dug up some old notes from a college class about marriage, and uh, they'll get shared. You'll I'm understand. I'm excited for that one. I'm excited for that one. <laughs> like- so my mom and I actually used to have a positivity contest between the two of us, because, you know, when I was maybe, you know, in the 13, 14 year old kind of phase of life, uh, we were going through a lot as a family. Uh, You know, the the 2008 recession was a thing. Uh, There were financial problems. That hit everybody. 
Yeah, and, and imagine how hard it hit independent churches with no denominational financial support. Yeah, so that all the money has to come up from the bottom, but the bottom's dried out. Yeah, it was it was a very difficult time. You know, there were financial problems. There were church. There was church drama that was affecting us a lot. Um, my grandmother was starting to show show signs of dementia, and we knew that she only had a few more years to live. And there was just so much pain and, and suffering in our family and in our church family at the time. And my mom and I felt like we couldn't even express negative feelings to each other. And my mom is one of my best friends. I'm the oldest child. I'm the only daughter. And even with that wonderful close relationship I had with my mom, we felt like it was not allowed for us to express any kind of negativity to each other. So we would have this little contest between ourselves to see who could say negative things in a positive way. And of course, your mom was suffering as well. I cannot even imagine what my parents went through. I and, just, I can't even imagine. And you and her are both suffering. And there's this invisible wall, this invisible hand between you saying, you are not allowed to process your own emotions. Yeah, because that would be a sin for the two of us to sit and talk negatively or gossip. That moves me on to the fourth and final aspect of cults which is emotional control. Emotional control is defined as instilling irrational fears or labeling some emotions as evil, wrong, you know, teaching people how to bury their feelings, bury their emotions to prevent them from reacting. Right. So if some emotions are seen as sinful, if you were a person that believed some emotions were sinful, like, which ones would be sinful? Um, so, well, lust would always be sinful. Lust um, is always sinful. Any sexual attraction that you were feeling towards someone who is not currently your married partner. Wow. Yes. Uh, some people would say it's okay to, like, have lust for your fiancé if you're really, really close to the getting married part. Other people would say that it's not appropriate until the ring's on the finger. So that that would always be, or almost always be, a sinful emotion. But you're just not even allowed to think about it. You're not supposed to. I mean, nobody lives by that because it's clearly impossible. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, but, but yes. Imagine it, marrying somebody that didn't feel anything towards you. And then they find out, oh, the ring goes on the finger. Now I'm allowed to feel things. And what if you don't feel things? What if you don't feel things? That's terrible. It, it is. And it, it is a thing that does sometimes happen. So anger that is not righteous anger would always be a, a, a sinful or a negative emotion. If you're angry because the liberals are taking over the country, that's it's considered righteous anger. If you're angry because of social changes that you see to be not appropriate. Sinful. Sinful, yeah. That would be considered righteous anger. You know, if you're angry at your kid for breaking a lamp that's not necessarily considered righteous anger. Or if you're angry at your spouse, um, especially if you're a woman, <laughs> that's wow. not considered a, a appropriate or righteous anger. Right, because your husband is above you in the hierarchy of... Well, the umbrella, yeah. Yeah, the umbrella of, of God's umbrella of, of the hierarchy. Yes. I'm, yeah. <laughs> oh, you've seen that. Great. I've seen that. I've seen that. <laughs> Great, you're up to speed. Perfect. <laughs> so... um. This is, Jealousy. this is, by by the way, people who don't know what we're talking about, it's like God is the umbrella that protects everyone, and then below that is the man. Pastor. Below yeah, that is, the, is pastor. the pastor, and then the husband. Pastor is a smaller umbrella beneath God, and then a smaller umbrella beneath pastor is husband, and then below that is wife, and then is children. Right, and that's the, the umbrella of authority and protection. And then after that, like, where do you, where do pets go? Or like pets, do they get their own branch? <laughs> pets or? don't have souls, silly. <laughs> they don't have souls? Okay. No, pets don't have souls. Um, so, so God doesn't protect them. Apparently not. So jealousy would be another one of those emotions that would not be allowed to be felt. Like we just talked about, cults will use cliches, rhyming phrases that'll stick in your head. They'll use all of these little different mechanisms. You know, I was taught as a child how to redirect my thoughts. 
if I got a rock and roll song stuck in my head, how oh. to redirect my thoughts to get that song out of my head. But if you, you know, if you get a image that is making you feel lust stuck in your head, how to remove that from your thoughts, how to refocus your attention on something else. So Sadie, here's a question. You see the absolute most gorgeous man or woman and you're just immediately just like, wow, what like what are you redirecting your mind to think of? Probably Jesus dying on the cross. Jesus dying on the cross, not very sexy. Yeah, so and, and especially not the way it's portrayed within, you know, fundamentalist or evangelical Christian circles. Yeah, so you're you're um not just expected, you're trained to redirect any thoughts that are not considered good thoughts or emotions that are not considered a- appropriate emotions in other ways. So you wouldn't even so allow it's not yourself. Like the, oh, I got to think about baseball. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not unlike that. <laughs> think about baseball. Think about baseball. Think about baseball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not unlike that, actually. Emotional control will also has an even darker side than that. Emotional control instills irrational fears or phobias of what might happen if you leave the group. So there was a story that I was told growing up, heard it from several different pastors in several different places. There was an early IFB pastor, and I think it was J. Frank Norris, but I'm going to have to fact check myself on who it actually was. This pastor uh, had a young man affiliated with his church who had decided to leave the church and go off into sin. And this young man was rebellious and he wanted to be worldly and he did not want to be part of the pastor's church anymore. And he began to threaten the pastor with uh, attacks again, you know, verbal attacks against the pastor Uh, maybe threatening to physically hurt him at some point in the future. And the pastor told him, young man, do not raise your hand up against the man of God. And the young man didn't listen. And about a week later, this pastor was driving down the road and he saw a horrible car wreck on the side of the road. And I I do want to warn you, this next part is a little bit graphic. The pastor pulls over up next to this car wreck, and he sees that the victim of the car wreck was the young man who had threatened him and the young man who wanted to go off into sin. So it's like a full, like, deus ex machina situation. I don't know what that is. (laughs) Oh, deus ex machina is, like, basically, like, some, like, an act from above, almost. Like, you see it in, in, like movies and tv where like the plot will be happening or something and then something just out of nowhere happens and intervenes and things just sort of take a left turn so it's like a full like deus ex machina situation right and uh i'll spare you some of the the really terrible details but the car wreck when this story is told it's described in really grisly detail that uh, I don't believe is appropriate for a child of three or five years old, which is the age I was when I was hearing it for the first time. It's probably also anatomically impossible. Most likely. Uh, But what is claimed in this story is that as part of the injury from this car wreck, the young man had uh, his head split open and some of his brain matter was lying on the asphalt outside of the car. Ew. It's pretty gross. So this pastor uh, reached, got a mason jar, which magically happened to be in the back of his car for some reason, scooped some of the brain matter off the side of the road. The real question is why there was the mason jar in the back of the pastor's car. <laughs> well, there are a couple of different questions here because the next part of the story is he was filled he the jar with formaldehyde. Was he running? Was he running moonshine? I don't know. The next part of the story is he filled the jar with formaldehyde. So then you also have to ask where did he get the formaldehyde? He's a he's a southern man. In in what year is this? The the I don't the, know early sixties. Oh, the early sixties. Oh, I thought you were going to say it was like. The 20s or the Oh, no, this 30s. is like fairly yeah. recent. <laughs> if it was like the 20s, then I would say, yeah, he's definitely a bootlegger. And, but Maybe this... he needs to examine that about himself. <laughs> Maybe he does. But no, the story goes that he scoops up these brains off the sidewalk and takes them to the pulpit the next 
week and says, this is what happens if you leave this church. This is what happens if you raise up your hand against a pastor. Wow. And, you know, you and I just picked apart that story. You know, how did he happen to be driving by the car wreck? Are the details that are incredibly violent and gory that were told to me, are those even anatomically possible? Is that even true? Where did the mason jar come from? Where did the formaldehyde come from? But as a child, as a little tiny, you know, kindergarten or first grade student hearing that story, it was terrifying. It's like a ghost story that's being told to you as something that's real. And you believe that it's real, yeah. Of course I believed that I was hearing it from my pastors. I was hearing it from my dad. I And I was a tiny little child. I didn't have the critical thinking skills to wonder, hmm, wonder where the mason jar came from. Right. Because I, mean, I had been told, believe everything the pastor says every time without question. So I believed that if I did run away, and I, I did think about, you know, start thinking about running away or, or trying to leave on my own. By the time I was 15 or 16, that had crossed my mind. But I truly thought that if I did, I would get hit by a car or struck by lightning or kidnapped. I truly believed that horrible, horrible things happen to people who leave. When the police come and they find this guy dead, and I'm sure that they do an autopsy, are they just going to be like, well, this guy's dead and his brain's gone? Is that just like a oh I'm gonna shrug my shoulders moment? Like <laughs> I'm I am knows? not sure. And I've um I've Boy, not that's yet a gotten, tough one. I'm stumped. <laughs> I've not yet gotten around to trying to track down, you know, whether any part of that story is true. Uh I know that it's incredibly common that everybody I know has heard that story from some pastor at some point. So I know it gets passed around a lot. I think it's published somewhere in a book and claimed to be true. I have just not gotten around. There are just so many things. Who knows? Maybe we can do a we can do a future episode where we We really dig into it. (laughs) Where we try to find out if it's real. That's actually a great idea. Because what I found since getting out is there is just so much that was claimed as true that nobody has ever fact checked that I know of. And that I just have this morbid curiosity. You know, I no longer believe that people who leave the independent Baptist church are any more likely than anyone else to get in a horrible car wreck or get kidnapped or get hit by lightning or have their house burned down or any of the million terrible things that I imagined. Well, that's a huge step forward. But I still have (laughs) this. And it's really, really great to start living with less of that daily fear and to feel like, I do occasionally get these paranoid thoughts that that might happen to me, but for that not to be my daily fear is really great. But I still have this morbid curiosity. I want to know if that ever really did happen. Basically, those four aspects, the behavior control, the information control, the thought control, and the emotion control are the four things that make something a cult. So, Right. It's a combination of all four of those things used to specifically for the purpose of manipulating people. Right. The other reason why we wanted to do this podcast, why we wanted to talk about this stuff is because we want to make sure that people hear and people understand the aspects of themselves that are being manipulated. There are lots of different groups that might be considered cults under the behavior and information and thought and and emotion control model, the bite model. What we want to do is just give information to people who might be part of those groups, because it's more than just religions. Uh, There are certain companies that function very much like a cult. There are some sports teams that have a little bit of that cult flavor to them. Oh, who are you talking about? I'm not going to (laughs) say. Are you going to offend your dad by saying Crimson Tide? No, I am absolutely not. Roll Tide. Bama forever. (laughs) But no, there are 
Are you going to talk about how difficult the SEC is as a conference? The SEC is the perfect conference. I'll have you know. It is. A, it is the highest degree of difficulty conference. So the teams that come out yeah, of there are better where suited. Alabama belongs because we're awesome. I'm sorry. That's we got off track there. Yeah, <laughs> but no, there are um, there are lots of people who might be being manipulated by these cult-like attributes or people who might be in some kind of cult. And the first thing that you can do if you think that might apply to you is just gather information, read through the Byte model on the freedom of, what is it, freedom of mind? Freedomofmind.com. Yeah, just read through the Byte model, see if it applies. Leaving for me, so I was born into a cult that is heavily psychologically abusive spiritually abusive, emotionally abusive, uh, but I was not locked. I was never locked in a cage or locked in a room. I was never kept on a locked compound. My travel was restricted, but only mentally. I was never physically locked up or kept someplace. And even then, it took me years and years and years to break the chains that had been put on my mind and on my spirit. This is not something... If you're worried that you might be in a cult or a cult-like group, it's not something that is going to change tomorrow, and it's not something that has to change tomorrow. Gather some information, read the bite model, see if you think it applies. If you do think it applies, start doing your own research. Start accessing reliable outside information. Learn what a good source looks like. Start learning. And one thing that I also wanted to say is that Although Sadie has left the cult, if you look at her life right now, she has many of the things that a cult would describe as being attributes of somebody who is very successful or happy in the way that their life is going. You're married, mm-hmm. you you have a job, and even still to this day, would if somebody came up to the street and asked you if you believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ, you would say yes. Yeah, absolutely. I have, you know, I really hesitate to participate in the pain Olympics. I would never want to say that my personal abuse and suffering was any lighter or any worse than any other person's who's been through similar things. I don't, you know, I don't want to say, oh, I've had it the worst. I've been through the worst thing anybody's ever been through. So I don't think that's accurate. But I have been through some pretty rough things. And in the end, I believe that the independent Baptist movement stole the first 20 years of my life. My first movie, my first kiss, these things that, you know, things that I missed. I missed, I never went to prom. I never got a lot of the high school or college experience that most people got. I never got to go to a science museum and be allowed to go in the evolution section of the museum. All of these, you know, these little things that I felt like got stolen away from me, my happiness and my peace and my ability to have a childhood without these vast existential worries about all the people who are dying and going to hell and how it's my fault. That All of those childhood and young adult experiences were stolen from me, but I'm not going to let that affect me permanently. At one point, I did really fantasize about just dropping everything, changing my name, moving to some other country, and just starting over. But in the end, I decided to accept what I've been through learn from it, and then start building. And I've built a really happy life for myself. I have a wonderful husband. I have a beautiful cat. I live in a nice place. Uh, I have food security, which is something that I didn't have for a very long time. I have built a really good life for myself, and I'm continuing to do so. And I'm really proud of that. And that's the third reason why we wanted to do this podcast, is to show people who may be involved in a group like this, that if you decide to leave, there is a life for you outside. 
there's a life for you and it's whatever you want it to be. If you want to get out of the cult and become an atheist, that is an option that is available to you. And I will still think you're great. If you want to get out of the cult and just become a regular old like Southern Baptist, that's an option that's available for you and I'll still think you're great. If you want to get out and become a Buddhist or get out and become a non-denominational Christian or whatever path spiritually you're led down, I'll think that's great and I'll be proud of you. I'll be happy for you. You can build. You know, in, in the IFB church, your life follows these very formulaic rules. You know, if you think about it, Hiles Anderson College offers three or four degree programs for women. You can be a teacher. You can be a wife and mom. Uh, you can be a church secretary, or you can get a Bible degree and maybe be a missionary. And that's it. Well, there are, there are a lot more options out there. And you get to you get to pick. You get to choose. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it was easy. I lost out on a college education because I went to two unaccredited colleges. And even if I had completed a college degree, it wouldn't be worth anything. I lost a lot of money. I lost college scholarships and I lost the opportunity to have a college degree right now. I lost five years that I could have been part of a part of the workforce and building my financial future. I was behind. It's not easy. I did lose a lot, but I'm really, really happy with where I've ended up now. And I'm happy to have options. I'm happy to have choices. Thank you very much for saying that. I know this was a heavy first episode, but one of the things that we're going to do is to lighten up some of the subject material by having a segment towards the end of every episode where we get to introduce Sadie to something new that she might not have experienced in her childhood. And I just decided that the first episode or the next episode that we're going to do, um, I'm going to have her watch a bunch of episodes of the, of Pokemon. <laughs> so and do we're going to talk know. about Pokemon. So do you want to know what I heard about Pokemon growing up? We'll talk about it next time. We'll but, talk about it next time. But okay. if you want to know what the cult thinks of Pokemon, and what the, I think of it now. And what she thinks of it now after having watched, uh, I don't know, four, five, six episodes, then tune into the next episode of Leaving Eden. And on that note, I think it's about time for us to wrap up this episode, um, this first episode of the Leaving Eden podcast. Once again, my name is Gavriel Ha Cohen. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Gavriel Ha Cohen. Uh, at G-A-V-R-I-E-L-H-A-C-O-H-E-N you can follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Leaving Eden Podcast and Sadie would you like to plug your social media? Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music uh, or on Twitter I'm at Hell Yes Sadie Alright Thank you very much you Have a nice day but old rolling river tide Peel me in too many days No regrets, no confusion There'll be no pollution I'm so thankful I've decided To change my ways I'm so thankful I decided to change